Wisconsin. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to share with you today on what the science is saying about adaptation to climate change. So first, what does adaptation to climate change mean? And how is this different to mitigation of climate change? Well, according to the IPCC, adaptation to climate change refers to the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects. So, and, and this is in order to moderate harm or to exploit beneficial opportunities. So for instance, in response to increasingly scarce water, adaptation options could include rainwater harvesting or irrigation. This is quite different to mitigation, which refers to any human intervention to reduce emissions or to enhance sinks of greenhouse gases. For example, reforestation, which draws carbon from the atmosphere and stores it in trees. It is important to recognize that both adaptation and mitigation are absolutely critical if we are to find a climate resilient pathway forward. We already know that about 3.6 billion people are now living in global hotspots of high vulnerability to climate change, and that many of these are in the developing world, across small island states, Central and South America, large parts of Africa, South Asia, and the Arctic. These regions are already experiencing challenges ranging from limited access to water, sanitation, and health services, to actual loss of habitability on some small islands. Many of these places also have high levels of climate-sensitive livelihoods, such as smallholder farms and fishing communities. And all of these are expected to increase in vulnerability with time. The key to addressing this vulnerability, ladies and gentlemen, is adaptation to save lives and livelihoods, to reduce risk, and to enable other multiple benefits. But how well have we been adapting to climate change? Well, while 170 countries have included adaptation into their policies and planning, our current progress is uneven, and we are not adapting fast enough. There are, in fact, increasing gaps between adaptation actions being taken now and with what is actually needed to tackle both current and future challenges. In particular, these gaps are largest amongst lower income populations and other disadvantaged groups. Indeed, it is the poorest and most vulnerable populations and regions that are already being disproportionately affected by climate change. And this will continue to undermine development during the coming century. It is also important to note that there are limits to adaptation. First of all, adaptation cannot prevent all losses and damages. And even with effective adaptation, limits will be reached with higher levels of global warming. Some natural solutions, will, for instance, will no longer work above 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the feasibility of those that do remain will likely change. So for example, above 1.5 degrees Celsius, a lack of fresh water could mean that populations dependent on glaciers and snowmelt may no longer be able to adapt. And by 2 degrees Celsius, it may be especially challenging to farm multiple staple crops in many current growing areas, particularly within the tropics. Just stop for a moment and think about what this might mean for global food security. However, Despite all of these barriers and potential limitations, the IPCC report shows that there are feasible, effective options that we can take to reduce risks to people and nature, which would enable high levels of human health and well-being, economic and social resilience, ecosystem health, and planetary health. But it is important to recognize that opportunities for such adaptation are not evenly distributed for everyone across the world. And until we can close this development gap and address the drivers of vulnerability, adaptation is probably going to be ina inadequate. Another major takeaway from the science is that in order to have a good chance at effective adaptation, it is absolutely crucial to prioritize equity and justice. But this has not been the case with current global financial flows, which are insufficient, especially to developing countries. Specifically, the overwhelming majority of global track climate finance targets emissions reduction, that is mitigation, and only a small proportion is allocated to adaptation. Additionally, most of the adaptation finance made available to many developing countries, such as the SIDS and across Africa, have taken the form of debt-creating concessional loans instead of grants. 
And further, despite the lobbying from developing nations for the allocation of finance and resources to address the losses and damages that are increasingly being faced by these countries, there has been no success to date. The reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that urgent action is required to adapt within a small and rapidly closing window of potentially less than a decade. At the same time, it is also essential to make rapid, deep cuts into greenhouse gas emissions in order to keep the maximum number of adaptation options open. It is critical to remember that climate resilient development is already challenging at our current global warming level of 1.1 degrees Celsius, and that the prospects in some regions will be even further limited if global warming exceeds 1.5 degrees Celsius. I may not even be possible in some regions, including small islands, deserts, mountains, and polar regions if warming exceeds two degrees Celsius. Starting today, every action, every choice, every decision matters, because each of them can take us away from or towards a livable future. I thank you so much. <laughs>